And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Robert Bourdon. Bob Bourdon is the Thaddeus R. Beale Clinical Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and the founder of the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program. He's taught many courses at Harvard Law School, including the school's flagship negotiation workshop. Bob also teaches in the Harvard Negotiation Institute and the Harvard Program on Negotiation Senior Executive Education Seminars. In 2007, Bob received the Albert Sachs Paul Freund Teaching Award at Harvard Law School, presented annually to a member of the Faculty for Teaching Excellence, Mentorship of Students, and General Contribution to the Life of the Law School. In 2010, the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution awarded Bob its Problem Solving in the Law School Curriculum Award for his innovative work in creating and building the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program. In 2012, 13, 16, and 17, Bob was selected by the graduating class as one of four Harvard Law School faculty members to deliver a last lecture to the class prior to graduation. There's no surprise why we wanted Bob to come for this session today. Bob's research interests include the assessment, reform, design, and implementation of dispute handling systems and developing and testing methods of effective public dialogue on issues that cut to the core of identity, meaning, belonging, and belief. Bob is the author of many books and articles and is frequently featured in various print and broadcast media outlets. It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Bob Bourdon. Thanks for that really um, wonderful introduction, and, and good morning, everyone. I'm uh, really honored to be here to celebrate the 10th anniversary of your mediation clinic. And I'm thankful to Professor Simmons and Professor Del Gobo and Professor Bevilacqua for inviting me and, and seeing me here today. Um, over the past few weeks, um, I've had a chance to look at some of the work that's done here at the Winkler Institute. and it's amazing. Um, I am so impressed by work that really goes beyond mediation, um, but that really includes um, innovative work around access to justice, around dispute resolution systems. Um, and you know, as I was thinking about you know, the topic of the whole conference, right, is the future of dispute resolution. And I was thinking, um, you know, one way to make this really, really simple and maybe win some awards from some of you, um, is to just say that the future of dispute resolution is actually really you. Um, uh, because it's really clear that the creative instinct that you have here, um, the instinct to improve access to justice, um, to think really broadly about what we can do to um, help real people handle conflicts, um, that's all here in this place. So, um, so I want to just tip my hat to all of you and the work that you do. Um, and also just say that as I thought about ending the speech right there, um, it also occurred to me that if I did that, my reimbursement may not get made. So I decided to actually write a talk. Um, so, um, so I mean what I say, and I'm also going to talk a little bit on um, some thoughts on the future of dispute resolution. Um, but I want to say because we're focusing on the future, um, I'm actually not going to focus uh, primarily on resolution um, because I don't, my personal view is at least for the near term, um, the future of our field ought not to be uh, primarily focused on resolving disputes. Um, I think it's true that ours is a field that has gotten a fair amount of traction, um, at least in law schools, because of its emphasis on problem solving. Um, and I think right now, um, if we focus our energies and our work primarily around the ideas of resolving disputes and solving problems, we actually might be misreading the signs of the times. We actually might be missing a really opportunity, uh, important opportunity to make a critical contribution that I think our society needs right now and that may not come from other quarters uh, besides our own. Um, I actually think the instinct to focus um, on almost exclusively on problem solving in professional education right now, whether it be law schools or business schools or schools of public policy, um, while very well intentioned, might be actually distracting us from focusing our attention on building a sensibility and a skill set that I think is really in short supply in our society right now. So 
Um, I realize this is probably the moment when Professor Simmons is thinking, what a monumental error I made in inviting Bob to come here today, and can you cut this guy's mic? Um, so, so before I go on, let me just say first, right, um, I am in favor of problem solving. <laughs> and in fact, um, I, you know, your, your introduction mentioned that I, I started this whole clinic around problem solving. I think it's critically important. I want to commend that work. I want to say we should continue that work. Um, I also want to say what I'm going to talk about is, in fact, relevant to dispute resolution. Um, it's just um, not about resolution, and problem solving has its limits. So, you know, if I kind of show you these photos right now, um, my guess is a as you take a look at some of these, um, I'm guessing that few of you would savor an opportunity to have a genuine conversation with uh, some of the people holding some of the views that you see up here. And I, I want to be clear what I mean by conversation, right? I don't mean a debate. I don't mean a negotiation. I don't mean some opportunity to persuade them or prove them wrong. Um, when I say conversation, what I mean is something that is marked by genuine and generous listening, as well as authentic and really articulate expression of your own views. And my guess is, when you see some of this, for most of you, instead of making you say, oh, I really want to sit down and deeply listen to them and have a conversation with them, I think you're more likely to want to do this. Raise some money for your favorite political candidate, or maybe donate, uh, or maybe go out and canvas, or maybe make sure you and all of your friends vote. Um, do some kind of resistance, some kind of mobilization. Um, and, you know, I want to say civic engagement at this moment really, really matters. Um, but today, I want to make the case that there is a particular form of social activism um, that our field, I think, is particularly well-placed to focus on um, that I don't see us doing enough of right now. And this kind of activism is, is something that I am calling um, conflict resilience. So. Conflict resilience um, is, in my mind, way more than problem solving or negotiating or mediating or consensus building. Um, it's really a unique ability to sit and be fully present in the presence of others who have strongly divergent views than ours on very critical issues that cut to our core, and to listen to them with a full and generous heart, and then to express our viewpoint with authenticity and with grace in a way that maximizes the likelihood that individuals on the other side can hear us. So conflict resilience, in my mind, envisions doing this all without the purpose of persuading the other side, without the purpose necessarily of finding any common ground or solving any particular problem. And the reason why I think this is really important in this moment is that no matter how effective we may be at advocating or campaigning or negotiating or influencing, I think it's a simple fact that at least for the foreseeable future, there are going to be a non-trivial number of people on the other side of these contentious issues with whom we will need to live and interact and coexist. So I don't know what the world's gonna look like in 50 years, but at least for now, um, I think we could be confident that we will not be able to wholly persuade or otherwise completely vanquish the people who hold an opposite viewpoint on these issues. And the notion that we can coexist or thrive in a democratic society without the ability to sit in those really uncomfortable moments, um, I think is, is just wrongheaded. Um, and I think conflict resilience right now is actually dying in our society. Um, if I think about, you know, how do human beings handle conflict? So this is at the, you know, serious risk of oversimplifying, right? But broadly speaking, um, I want to suggest that there are kind of three approaches, right? One is something like fighting, right? Um, so fighting can, you know, look like this in a playground. Right? Or it could look like this when it escalates um, between uh, parties around some issues, right? with people screaming at each other. 
Um, in law schools, we teach a highly stylized form of fighting, um, something like that, right, in a courtroom, but it's basically fighting. Um, and regrettably, um, we also have violent conflict as a way that we handle and resolve disputes. Um, and what I want to suggest, right, is there's been a real increase in fighting as a way of handling or resolving disputes, um, particularly in Western democracy. So in my own country, um, um, you know, I mean, it's obviously in the news every day. Uh, just recently, we literally closed our government down for 35 days <laughs> uh, because of fighting. But this occurs uh, in Europe, if you think about Brexit. Um, it's not just about governments. Um, Today, a very big conference was convened in the Vatican um, for the first time in my memory and maybe in hundreds of years of Christendom, you have cardinals and bishops calling for the resignation of the Pope. Um, fighting to me seems to be on the rise. Um, now, a second mode, of course, is fleeing, right? Um, running away or avoiding a conflict. And this is a very popular form of conflict handling. Um, but I think we've developed some really new ways of fleeing over the past few years, sometimes maybe intentionally and sometimes not so much. Um, but social media outlets have become a way of, in a good sense, right, curating communities of interest, um, but unwittingly at times, and maybe sometimes quite wittingly, um, they've also become ways for us to personally curate tribes of shared interest, of shared viewpoint, of shared affiliation. And in an earlier age when community was really more geographically based, um, we could not simply escape when someone had a different view from ours, whether on a local or national or political issue. But now so much of our community, so much of our sense of connection comes from places where we can intentionally curate that, right, on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or YouTube. Um, and it becomes easy to really block out or ignore those with whom we disagree. And so I think the result is a lower conflict resilience threshold, right? When we feel uncomfortable, we escape. In the university setting, um, I think that there's been a different way that we've um, encouraged, perhaps, or permitted um, avoidance, right? So if I think about uh, the emergence of trigger warnings, right? This, I think, has led to a real cooling of contentious conversation uh, in university classrooms. And it's certainly true that there are topics that come up um, in a university setting that are, in fact, emotionally triggering for individuals at times. But I personally would contend that efforts to protect these students from feeling deeply uncomfortable does them a real disservice. Um, they need to be able to build a conflict resilience muscle in order to survive in diverse and pluralistic society. Um, and so shielding them from that um, actually hurts our efforts to build conflict resilience. So I want to be clear about this, right? I want to make a really bright line distinction between uh, situations where there is genuine trauma in play um, and situations where there are just kind of strong feelings of discomfort and displeasure. Um, where there's trauma in play because of an individual's past experiences, of course, students need to be able to take care of themselves and they need to be empowered to do that. Um, but in situations where it's simply, this would be unpleasant, uncomfortable, awkward, um, I think we really have a duty as educators to actually bring those controversial and sometimes triggering topics into the room. I think another way in which we've encouraged or allowed or we've seen an increase in um, fleeing is around the modern kind of cable news arrangement, um, which really has become um, very siloed. We can go to our partisan news outlet of choice. Um, and get our complete way of seeing the world from um, there and ignore the other side completely. So I think we have these new ways of fleeing, 
We have an increase in, fix, uh, in, in fighting. And of course, the third way of handling uh, disputes is fixing, right, or problem solving. Um, the kinds of things our field has done very well, whether with respect to mediation or negotiation or consensus building, restorative justice practices, um, the things you kind of learn through the classes that the Winkler Institute offers. Um, and I think we've done well over the past 30 years as a field, um, really latching on, on to calls within the legal profession um, to adopt a more problem-solving orientation to, to what we do. Uh, I think because the academy has often been resistant to interdisciplinary fields such as ours, and resistant often to fields that have a very practical and skills-based focus, um, those of us in the ADR field um, have really effectively leveraged this focus on problem solving um, as a way to gain a greater acceptance in, in law school teaching and in law school hiring. And much of this work, I think, was spearheaded um, in the 90, uh, 1990s and early 2000s uh, by funding from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. The problem, of course, um, is that I think we're in a moment where problem solving just isn't going to happen on at least some strongly divergent viewpoints, um, whether because they're rooted in deep religious, cultural, or identity-based issues, there is unlikely to be a meeting of the minds in the short term. Um, and so some of these issues, I mean, I just want to say, may feel very basic and fundamental. Um, even non-negotiable to one side or both. So whether that's around reproductive rights, religious freedom, healthcare as a human right for all, um, LGBTQ rights, um, um, all of these for one or both sides may feel very um, fundamental and zero sum. But I think it is here where this notion of conflict resilience uh, really matters and where we have an opportunity um, in our field to focus some of our attention and energy on writing about it, on building some skills um, in our students for it, and on building really what is, I think, a uh, sensibility for conflict resilience. Um, and I, I am really troubled by some of the trends that I have seen um, that I think are making that uh, need even greater. So if we think about political polarization uh, in society, you know, it seems like a long time ago, right, on September 11, 2001, um, the entire United States Congress gathered on the steps of the Capitol building um, to sing the national anthem together. Um, I'm hard pressed to think the entire United States Congress being able to do anything um, together at this point. Um, at that time, the members clearly had pol policy differences, right? But today, there is this villainization, this polarization and dehumanization on all sides. And it's spurred, I think, a real sense of homeless, hopelessness um, around the possibility for reconciliation or unity. And I think this hopelessness is really dangerous, right? In the US context, um, we've seen in the past few years the state of political dialogue mirroring what it looked like in the decade before the Civil War um, in the United States. I'm not saying there's going to be a Civil War, right? But what we've really seen are some real similarities. Um, you know, even within Congress, right? In 1856, um, Congressman Preston Brooks, which is the guy with the cane, um, actually caned Senator Charles Sum Sum Sumner on the floor of the Senate. Um, and just about you know, a few months ago, um, we had on national TV a US senator um, literally spewing at the other party. Um, wasn't physical violence, um, but it wasn't pretty. Um, you know, more broadly, in the decade before the Civil War, um, what you saw was a continual um, series of negotiations that were never ending with very um, temporary solutions, quote unquote solutions that everybody knew were not gonna last, right? Whether you know, this is the Missouri Compromise around the spread of slavery, 
um, into the new states. Um, we have the same problem right now, whether it's around the building of a border wall and immigration, or whether it's around health care. Um, never ending negotiation with every so often a tiny temporary agreement, um, which is really troubling. I think the other troubling trend that I've seen is an increase um, in strategic and sometimes even coached avoidance of engaging in differences, whether it's in a classroom uh, or it's in our family or with our friends. I think despite the valiant efforts of admissions offices to um, create uh, diverse student bodies, politically, racially, socioeconomically, geographically, um, there's a real sense that, at least from my experience, and I don't, can't speak to what it's like here, um, but a real sense that the level of actual vibrant discussion and, de and debate and conversation in, cl in classrooms around political issues has declined enormously over the past few years. Um, and I think that part of the reason why is there's a real feeling that there's no winning in putting your views out there because they may be on some anonymous website immediately. Um, you may very quickly be labeled as fill in the blank, racist, socialist, communist, sexist, right? So there's this real feeling <laughs> that if I say something that comes out the wrong way, I'm gonna be labeled. Um, the best thing I could do is say nothing and hang out with my tribe. Um, and so, um, I think that's really, really um, troubling. Um, and then the third thing I want to say, um, and this is something that I find surprising, although maybe I shouldn't, but I think many people see very little value to the idea of being in the presence of those with whom we have strong, differing viewpoints, unless we're coming together to solve a problem or find some common ground. So in some of the dialogue work that I've done um, with students in my facilitation class, um, at the end of the class, we last three weeks, we have people come in and do real dialogues, like we recruit students. And I've been struck by how many people will, at the last minute, cancel, because they'll say, oh, Professor Bordone, I thought this was going to be a chance to sharpen my debate skills. Or I thought I'd have a chance to really like, learn how to persuade the other side. Or, oh, it's really disappointing that we're not going to do a joint project as a result of this. I get that, right? Because so much of our education is around problem solving, problem solving, problem solving. I'm really busy if I'm not solving a problem, if I'm just sitting there in some kind of dialogue, listening and learning, uh, what's the point? Um, but in my own view, right, um, there is a very, very important point around this. Um, um, because I think that conflict resilience gets us many things. Um, first of all, right, cultivating in our students an inner fortitude, a sense of integrity and wholeness that allows them to put themselves forward in the world as they are, but also actually allows them to move from a stance of certainty to curiosity. Um, is a really central leadership skill. Um, I think the ability to be a good leader um, is the ability to sit in a lot of discomfort. Um, I think conflict resilience as a skill in itself um, helps us to really grow in empathy. Um, and that is a skill that's useful in any kind of domain, right? it will lead to a reduction in demonization, a reduction in villainization. Um, what we know is that when we put people in dialogue around really um, contentious issues, so I do a lot of work with an organization called Seeds of Peace. I was in Cyprus a few weeks ago and uh, got into a conversation over dinner with a few of the Israeli and Palestinian students, and they're like, yeah, you know, dialogue really hardened us in our views. Like, you know, one of the Israeli students said, as, you know, as kind of a progressive Israeli, I came in here thinking like, oh, this is going to be great. And in fact, I feel like I moved appreciably to the right. But I know these people now. 
and I feel a totally different orientation to how I think about the situation, even though my own views um, have hardened, right? And so I think also um, we can see as a result of conflict resilience an increase in social capital, um, the ability to coexist peacefully, and even if we don't, um, even if we don't solve the particular problem that we're talking about, I think it increases our ability to problem solve around a whole bunch of issues where we may have a lot more of an agreement. So there are really independent values to building uh, this um, conflict resilience skill. So turns out I've spoken a few times um, about this idea of conflict resilience to some colleagues and friends and family. And I've received a range of responses. So I, I'm actually not going to share with you the, any responses that were supportive or enthusiastic, although I'm grateful for them. Um, uh, but I want to share with you a few of the concerns that have been raised, because um, I think that they have allowed me to sharpen a little bit of my thinking on this. And I'll certainly welcome your concerns as well, because that will sharpen my thinking further. Um, so one, right? When I talk about conflict resilience, I want to be clear that what I do not mean is a dialogue without teeth or something that's really nicey-nice, um, where as soon as something stressful or, or, or upsetting comes up, the facilitators change the topic. Um, and I want to be clear, right, it doesn't have with it some kind of, kind of kumbaya, lion with the lamb um, ideas around it. To be clear, right, I'm in favor of advancing peace. <laughs> um, I love it if the lion sits down with the lamb, right? But I don't see this skill, what as we're talking about, um, as necessarily like pretty or avoidant um, uh, or, yeah, just let's focus on the areas where we can agree, right? The other thing I want to be clear about, though, is that I don't mean something, uh, some of you may have read uh, Brad Blanton's book, Radical Honesty. So uh, no one's looking, so some of you may know it. So the idea of radical honesty is this idea that you should take everything that you're thinking and just say it, unfiltered. Um, this is not what I mean. Um, for those of you who are old enough to remember, growing up, when I was growing up, there was a show uh, on the TV networks called The Golden Girls. And there was this character who was the kind of grandmother. Her name was, her name was uh, Sophia. And Sophia had had a brain injury. And so she just kind of said whatever came to her mouth and to her mind, just completely unfiltered. Um, this is not what I mean either. Um, I think that radical honesty does not require any skill at all. <laughs> um, and when I talk about um, conflict resilience, what I mean is we're not tiptoeing around the edges of disagreement. We're actually going to dig into the hard stuff. Um, but the skill is how do I say it with authenticity, but in a way that maximizes the chance that the other side can actually hear it. Um, and so this is a sensibility, and it's also a skill set. And the skill set really involves the listening piece, right? But then the assertiveness piece. And the sensibility, um, I think, is a really internal one of being prepared to and ready to sit with, um, different, with discomfort. Um, and I think discomfort is something that I don't think was ever popular in the world, <laughs> um, but I think um, has become something generally, whether it's discomfort with pain, physical pain, uh, with a long line, <laughs> with having to sit through anything we don't like, um, our tolerance for that um, just has really gone down, I think. The other concern um, around conflict resilience um, that I have heard and I think is worth addressing um, really relates to structural and societal power differences. Um, so the idea of sitting in the presence of uh, will mean very different things for particular constituencies and populations. So if you imagine a hard conversation between police officers in a primarily white police force and persons of color in that community, um, I want to suggest that um, this is necessarily going to raise really hard questions around power 
and privilege and the danger that you're going to replicate the same kind of structural imbalances in whatever that dialogue space is that exist um, in the greater society, right? So what, for what one community or group might feel like uh, theoretical or maybe more intellectual about diverse ideas and different viewpoints, for the other group, right, is about their very lives, right, their safety and security. So I don't want to downplay the courage it would take for, you know, a white police officer to engage in a dialogue like that, right, like that. But I do want to make the argument that the degree of resilience expected from one set of stakeholders is going to be much higher than the degree of resilience that's expected from the other set of stakeholders. And so I think what that means, and that, that's one context, right? But this could be said for any number of contexts. Um, so you know, a conversation about the definition of marriage um, has a really different um, valence for me as a gay man than perhaps for a heterosexual person. Again, not to downplay the courage it would take for a heterosexual person to be in that dialogue. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not going to affect their life in quite the way, same way it would affect my life. Um, and that can go for anything around reproductive rights or a whole bunch of other um, issues. So I think what that means is that um, to the degree our field becomes an advocate for conflict resilience, we need to think about how do we design spaces that take account of structural and power differences? Um, um, how do we do it in a way that really tries to minimize a power differential, even acknowledging that we will not be able to eliminate it wholly? Um, but it is my view, at least, that we still have to insist on bringing people together. Uh, on creating the space um, with thoughtfulness and with care, but also with courage and passion. Um, I just reject the argument that kind of sitting in a room with the other side is a path of accommodation or a path of concession or a path of weakness. Um, and so for, to me, sitting with the other side is actually like a, a modeling of courage, um, a form of social activism, not all of us are called to do it, but those of us who are, um, I think we have to kind of get rid of the idea that we're making some kind of concession in doing that. Um, I mentioned earlier I do a lot of work with an organization called Seeds of Peace. So um, they've been working for about, um, not about, exactly, 27 years, um, bringing Israeli and Palestinian um, teenagers together for a three-week summer camp in the U.S. state of Maine. And um, the way this works is every single day, they have three hours of dialogue in the morning. And then the rest of the time is summer camp. Um, and um, it's a really, really intense. Um, I've, I've been there, um, and there's nothing like avoidant about it. There's nothing weak about it. They have these dialogues in, in small facilitation huts around the camp. Um, you will hear people yelling. You will occasionally see someone come out crying. Um, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, it's also inspiring, and it's inspiring not because um, there's this notion that, well, these kids in 15 years will be the leaders and who will bring about you know, a, a peaceful solution, although it would be wonderful if they did, right? It's, it's instead that these rising leaders are actually developing the skills of being able to sit in the face of conflict with someone who they have been told their whole life, um, and this is not an exaggeration, right, that the other side is their enemy to the death. Like, that's what they're told. Um, and the fact that actually, you know, I mean, actually friendships bought, form from this is really, really incredible. Um, so this ability to sit uncomfortably, um, I think, prepares these young people um, for a world where everyone's not going to see their way. So as I think about the future, uh, both as an academic and as a professional in the field, um, I actually think we have a pivotal moment of opportunity now. Um, you know, today, just looking at the agenda, right, we have this incredible diversity of topics and speakers and panels, and um, they celebrate really the remarkable achievements the dispute resolution field has made to the world. Um, 
in politics, in business, um, in government, and nonprofits. Um, and I think um, this is a real kind of inflection point moment as we see polarization growing in national governments, um, in houses of worship, universities, and even in our families. So my encouragement um, would be that we might actually grow beyond ideas of resolution and problem solving, not abandoning them, but growing from them. Um, I think that um, we are uniquely placed to do that. Um, and I think if we do that, right, we hopefully um, will have a world where we can build more connection, um, a world that looks a little bit more like this um, and not so much like this. So um, I want to thank you again for inviting me to be here. I don't know how much time, we have a little bit of time. Um, so I'm happy to have a, a conversation um, and some questions. And I want to say I'm really looking forward to all that I'm going to learn from all of you um, both now and for the rest of the day. Thanks for having me. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> My question is, you mentioned before one of the aspect of being able to engage in this um, kind of conflict resilience or resolution. Resilience. Is, yeah. resilient, thank you. Is assertiveness. Mm. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, by assertiveness, I think what I mean is developing the ability to express your viewpoint your experience, your story, um, fully and authentically. Um, so in a way that, um, in a way that actually might make you vulnerable. Um, so I think listening is very important and curiosity is very important. But the other half of it is being a, kind of assertive or sharing how you see the world, right? Because that's where I think part of the resilience. Is that responsive or, yeah? Yes. Thank you so much for your remarks. Fascinating. Yeah. And I want to see if there's a connection between the conflict resolution tradition I come out of, community mediation, yeah. neighborhood conflict resolution, really dispute resolution in people's private lives, where it's always been our thesis that our job is relationship building then conflict resolution happens. And I want to see if you would agree that this idea of resiliency is really a resiliency in our relationships to have the hard conversations and so on. It's not a solo activity, although you could argue we have a relationship with conflict, each of us, but you're talking about our interpersonal relationships and that resiliency is really a, a capacity that that relationship can handle a certain amount of conflict. And if that's the case, as I think it is, then I think we're kindred spirits. Uh, I completely agree with you. And I think one of the, you know, it's interesting because community mediation happily still brings the parties together in a room. Um, but a trend, I think, of mediation generally is not bringing the parties into the room, which I think to me is a symptom of what I see as the kind of growing problem. Um, and, and, you know, when I think about families, right, I feel like, um, Occasionally, usually in the U.S., it's around Thanksgiving time. You see these articles about like how to and how to handle Uncle Rocky, or something, right? Um, and I feel like sometimes you'll see a little bit of a tip on how to engage the conversation, but I feel like mostly it's how to avoid the conversation without a battle. And I think, what would it look like to actually engage a conversation that doesn't feel like a battle? <laughs> I mean, it feels like conflict, but it's not a battle, right? Because a battle has to have a winner and a loser. Um, and I think that takes both skills, but also, and this is why I keep using the word, I mean, I don't know what the right word is, um, sensibility or a capacity, um, uh, but a certain degree of self-confidence and self-comfort to be able to kind of sit in that. So, yeah. Yeah, Trevor. 
wondering if you could say a bit more, maybe in the classroom, but just generally, and this is not a uh, challenge, but more of a concern. If, yeah. if, if you're right, and if we do want to do more of this, it seems like it could go south in the wrong circumstances. So what kind of work needs to be done in the context, whether it's a classroom or at the camp or in some dialogue session, so that your effort to, to build resilience doesn't turn into more harm or yeah. more hurt? Yeah, this is a great, it's a great question. I think it's, um, so let's positing for the time being that my non-scientific observation and informal conversations with colleagues is accurate. Um, I think a number of things. So I think one, I mean, in an ideal world, right, all of our students would get some actual training on how to have really challenging conversations um, as a like real base of their like first year work, like how do you do this? That's one. Related to this, and I think very challenging, um, getting faculty to have some training in how to do this, <laughs> um, how to facilitate space. Um, some people are naturally good at it, some not so. Um, but I think getting people willing to get some training on that would be helpful. Third, um, I think um, is the establishment of some kind of shared norms or ground rules for how a classroom would operate. Um, so I don't know how things operate here at, you know, at Osgood, but I know, you know, at Harvard Law School, there's no such thing. Pe people just kind of go in and do whatever it is they do. Um, I think about, you know, in our negotiation class, we spend about 45 minutes on the first day of class in small groups talking about what are going to be the shared norms that we're going to use as a group. So for example, you know, a shared norm may be um, an agreement that we, what happens here um, is not gonna suddenly end up on an anonymous website. Um, it's gonna be brought to the room if there are concerns, right? Um, so whatever set of norms that we can agree upon, but doing that very explicitly, which doesn't mean someone might violate them, but at least it, um, I think it reduces the possibility or likelihood of that. You know, one of the things, I mean, it's interesting, I um, do not use the word um, safe when I'm setting up any kind of facilitation, classroom. I use the word lower risk. And I do that very explicitly, because I say, in light of the fact that there are people here <laughs> who have viewpoints and feelings, and there's 24 of you and one of me, I can't guarantee your safety. We can do some things to reduce the likelihood that, you know, to use the word harm, um, you know, will happen, but I, I can't guarantee that. And I, so I, I guess the last thing I would say to that is maybe just an invitation, um, you know, I mean, not to harm, <laughs> um, but an invitation to say, you might come, like, there's a chance you might leave a class or two feeling bruised a bit. And let's find some ways we could talk about that, but that that should be an expectation of what might happen. Is that, is that responsive, Trevor? Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you very much. The ideas are really intriguing, but I must find I find myself confused about the practical application. Yeah. What is the role of the neutral in a, in a mediation or arbitration or some other process um, to these concepts? How, how does the neutral deal with this? They don't have time to train the parties, yeah, for example. Yeah. yeah, so I think this is a good, you know, this is a good question. I mean, I think in a mediation situation, um, the likelihood um, that you will have that opportunity is probably low. Um, so I'm not saying it's generally applicable. Having said that, right, I'm doing a, um, a family mediation now um, that's been going on for some time, um, involving a whole bunch of people. And I got them to agree to a half day seminar with me um, around just some tools for having challenging conversations. Now, you can't always do that. I get that. Um, I think that there is more of an applicability if you're kind of facilitating a group, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say uh, a, a group working in a community around how are we going to think about building the next public school. 
um, and you're working with them some over time um, to invite them uh, and, and find ways for them to increase their cl client, uh, their conflict resilience threshold. Probably in an ordinary commercial mediation, less of a, less of a chance. Um, I, 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 I'm finding your, uh, the concept of conflict resiliency very fascinating. The part that troubled me a little bit was the comment about um, people being more entrenched in their viewpoint mm. <clears throat> as a part of the process. And so I haven't fully formed my question, but I, it, it's sort of what I'm concerned about is accountability. Um, and is there a, a, is there space or some sense of accountability as part of this conflict res resilience conversations? Because if there isn't going to be some sort of accountability, I'm concerned about if, if people are going to be more entrenched in their viewpoints that, that, that in the, it's the question about harm in the longer run that Trevor was asking. Yeah. Is there going to be less trust and less intimacy because of, a, because of, of a more entrenched viewpoint? It's, it's not a fully formed question, but how does accountability fit into this? When you say accountability, can I just ask, what do you mean by that? I think as part, as a lot of these conversations, especially as people become more and more entrenched in their viewpoints, there's yeah. a lack of insight about being accountable for, for um, positions you've taken or things that you've said. And there, I think that that's a piece, when I think about it, I think it's a piece that's missing between individualistic cultures and collectivist cultures. Mm. And that that's you know, a key significant piece of being able to work. And I wonder if, I mean, my next piece would be, I wonder if this is just a function of becoming more and more of an individualistic culture. Yeah, okay, great, that's helpful. Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, my, my, my experience, so my, my experience of this, one is like a lived experience doing this work with Seeds of Peace, and the other is uh, reading about work that was done in the mid-90s, and it's actually continued um, in the Boston area by a woman by the name of Susan Pudziba, who brought together um, pro-life and pro-choice women. Um, and I would say in both of those cases, um, certainly the re so there's actual research in the latter as opposed to my observed experience and conversations in the former. Um, even though the kind of views on the issues did harden, um, what changed was the way that both sides talk about the people on the other side. Um, they talk about the people on the other side as people <laughs> who have really different views, but coherent stories around those views that make sense to them. So this doesn't really answer your accountability question per se, but I think that um, there is more of a sense of a collective shared problem than you have a problem or you have a problem. So um, now, I mean, the question I wonder is how does that lead to a solution, right? On, on the pro-choice, pro-life, there's not going to be a solution. Um, what's interesting about, because that's a group, groups that met over 20 years, um, and over time, they actually started to do some joint projects together, which was not part, just to be clear, not part of the initial putting together of the dialogue. Um, but they started to do some work just around, you know, helping women. Uh, who, single moms, um, women with unplanned pregnancies, things that they could actually do together. So um, I, th I would say that the kind of safety around this is that if it's working, even if I become kind of more certain in my view or feel it more strongly, I think the way I talk about people on the other side of that is really different. Um, and that I think is really important for maybe not even solving the particular reason that brought us together, but finding all sorts of ways of working with people on a whole bunch of other issues. So. Okay. It's been a great uh, perspective that you have shared this morning. Um, I think I heard that this idea of being fixated with problem solving is probably a Western world notion. Mm. Help us understand maybe what are some other notions that maybe we should include 
and where, we, where can we learn from others? Yeah, that's a, I'm not sure I have a great answer to that. I'm, I mean, um, uh, I don't, I mean, I think because I'm so, I was trained in this kind of problem solving world. Um, um, I think I have less of a good insight on that. I'd welcome your thoughts on places that, where problem solving isn't so high on the list of priorities. Um, you know, I think, I mean, I actually think, at least in the law school world, I feel like there's a shift. I'm not sure, maybe this is wrong, but my sense is that even in the like 80s, 70s and 80s, problem solving was not the orientation of US law schools. It was something around, um, you know, making arguments. I mean, maybe justice, which is an important thing. Uh, we don't want to lose, right? But that's a little bit different than a problem-solving orientation. Um, so I don't know. Maybe maybe we could talk afterwards. I'd love I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you.